So as we look at these opportunities during the winter, we look at ways that we can engage with one another. And across the country, no matter where you're at, I happen to be in Minnesota. Um, we have folks joining us from across the country, the lower 48 and even Alaska, know that our Prevention Technology Transfer Center is seated at the University of Iowa. And we have this opportunity to come together to serve our tribal communities. And we know that there are a lot of great things that are happening, uh, whether it's storytelling or doing shoe games or the snake game, or no matter what community you're from, there are some really great opportunities to engage with our young people and our families to continue having them um, join together in a healthy way. What I'd like to invite you to do as we get started with our session today is in the chat. Go ahead and tell us who you are, where you're joining us from, which community you serve, so we get an idea of who's on the line with us today. We serve the National American Indian Alaska Native Communities across the country with our prevention center. We are funded, supported by a grant from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, and the content of this event is the creation of the presenter and the opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA, HHS, or the American Indian Alaska Native PTTC. At the end of today's session, know that we'll put together the video of our time together this afternoon. Um, you'll get a link to the presentation slides, the recording, and also we'll invite you to take part in our um, post-event survey. I put the QR code on the screen for you, and then there's also the hyperlink. I'll post the hyperlink occasionally in the chat box as you are posting who you are and where you're coming from. It's really important for us to know who we serve, who we're engaging with in our sessions. And when you take part in our survey, know that it is anonymous, cannot be traced back to you, but it's really important feedback that we get um, to be able to share with our team in-house as well as with our funders so they know the good work that we're doing and the quality of presenters that we have in our sessions. So we invite you to please uh, take the time after today's session to either follow the GIPRA survey through the QR code or through the hyperlink that you see on the screen there before you. And again, I'll post that in the chat box occasionally throughout our session. Although we're gathered virtually today, it's really important to us to take time to acknowledge the land and pay respect to the indigenous nations whose homelands were forcibly taken over and inhabited. Past and present, we wanna honor the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. I invite you now to take a few moments just to read through the last few paragraphs of this document that was created by three of my former colleagues, Ella Driscoll, Keely Driscoll, and Sean Bear, all who come from the Meskwaki Nation. It's really important for us to take the time to honor our culture, our tradition, and to know that during this winter time, it can be difficult in the area of social wellness and prevention. And um, during the few, a few months ago, during the summer, one of my colleagues worked on this document that you can find on our website and that will be emailed to you if you don't have access to it quickly enough. But the hyperlink is also there on the screen for you to know that there are needs that we have as individuals and as communities to stay connected. And social wellness is so important for our mental health, our spiritual health. And so we decided to create this six part series that we began back in December, caring for ourselves as we transition into winter and the importance of that, as well as um, looking at different aspects of our culture, which lead us up to today with our presenter who I'll introduce in just a few moments. But this six part series is available for you to join all six of them, one or two of them, whatever fits to your schedule. They are all being recorded so that we can share the sessions with you after the event, as well as the slide decks, so that we can look at different opportunities and think about different things that go on in our own tribal communities, both urban and rural, so that we can lead healthier lives and help our young people stay connected, help our elderly feel connected even during the winter months 
when so many times so many of us are isolated because of the weather and what's going on in our communities when it's really cold outside. And so um, I want to say thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Allison Bays, and I serve at the Prevention Technology Transfer Center with a team of people under the direction of our um, leader, Dr. Ana Helena Skinstad. And there are many of us who um, decide to work together across the centers and for different opportunities. And this is one of them because we want to work with our young people in the K through 12 setting during this winter as well. We've invited our K through 12 folks to be a part of the discussion, um, learning from uh, our presenter today and in the next few weeks through storytelling, caring for our elders and really connecting to our culture across the lifespan. No matter how old, how young you are, we all have a need to stay connected and rooted into our culture. And so it's really important that we look for opportunities like today to learn from our presenter and to find ways to help our young people remain healthy, stay healthy. As we begin, I'd like to just briefly introduce our speaker, Ms. Delina White. She's uh, from the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. Leech Lake, Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, and she's a fashion designer, jewelry maker, and beadwork artist. She has a bachelor's of science degree from Bemidji State University in business administration and management, and a management information systems minor. And this is her showing off her skills, dancing, sharing her artwork, sharing her love for her culture, and this is the opportunity that I get to turn the floor over to her and allow her to share more about herself and the wonderful work that she does in our tribal communities. Bonjour, everybody. Bakabio Sikwe Ndijenikas Makwan Ndu Dame. My name in Ojibwe language, the Anishinaabe Moen is wades in the water woman. So I have a really strong connection to the water, lakes and rivers. Um, I come from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and I just briefly wanted to say bonjour, hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. Thank you for the beautiful prayer. I really appreciate that. And um, so I just wanted to say, hey, and let you guys see me. So um, you know who, who I am as we move along and I'll get further into that introduction as well. So if we can move to the first, the first um, screen. So um, my presentation today is called Using Our Art and Tradition to Tell Our Stories, Indigenous Cultural Perspective Through Fashion. And I'm gonna talk a lot about indigenous materials and designs. And um, I just wanna talk a little bit about fashion, that fashion is a complex subject. Fashion is considered a hybrid subject because it brings together different contextual frameworks and disciplinary approaches, including those from anthropology, which is the study of cultures and people, art history, the study of artists and their work. Cultural studies is a specific study on ethnic groups and, in, and can include an emphasis in language, design studies, the study of materials and design elements such as construction, economics, the study of currency and how currency flows throughout the world, history, the study of important events, literature, the study of how people use language to communicate in highly specialized formats, Sociology, the study of how people interact with each other within a system. Visual arts, the study of art in specific genres using specialized techniques such as photography, watercolor, and te textiles such as fabrics in terms of its appeal to view, like hanging it on a wall or the way fabric flows while in motion on a person walking, for example, and business studies the study of developing strategies to sell your product or service. Next slide. So um, this is not the next slide. <laughs> uh -huh. 
So I just kind of wanted to go back to, um, to, to me talking directly to you all that um, just to give you a, a quick idea about what to expect in today's presentation, that fashion is more than just clothing, it's jewelry, tattoos, scarification, makeup, hair, and fragrance. So um, can you go back to showing me as a person so I can kind of see everybody? Okay, there we go, awesome, thank you. It is our, uh, fashion is our identity and it is a connection to our history, our values and our vision for the future. Artists can provide inspiration or motivation to make change, protect and thrive in a better world. Fashion can be used as a narrative to assert our rights for peace, protect our sacred sites from destruction, fight for a clean environment, and a means to express ourselves as a sovereign nation, and to make a declaration of an opinion, an attitude, an outlook on life, and our youth take full advantage of that fact. Yet, everyone has definitive likes and dislikes when it comes to what we will or will not wear. So we're just gonna kind of go through those types of things. And that's the way that we communicate through fashion. Next slide, please. So this is um, a photograph of a car, oh, a, a, a hood ornament on a Pontiac car. And what I like to do is we have people um, coming from all over the United States to um, participate that I like to use famous people so that um, people will have a reference as to where it is I come from and a little bit about who I am. And so I used this particular photograph in a previous presentation that I did for design people that went to the University of Minnesota. They were students in the design department of Minnesota. And I thought it was really um, awesome to see this particular hood ornament of Pontiac because it's just got a really neat design. But Pontiac um, was born in 1720 to 1769. He was an Odawa war chief and leader of the Three Fires Alliance between the Anishinaabe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi nations. And what I want to say about um, Pontiac is that he was born near the Maumee River, which is, is the present day Toledo, Ohio. And the war chief united 18 tribal nations to fight against the British invasion of the entire Great Lakes region during Pontiac's rebellion, also known as Pontiac's War, 1763 to 1765. And also, um, the Pontiac division about the car was one of four General Motors assembly plants located in Pontiac, Michigan, established in 1927. And the first Pontiac car was made in 1909. So next slide, please. So it's kind of like, oh, you know, why are we talking about Pontiac? And so the thing is, is because Pontiac was a Great Lakes woodland native person. And this is... Um, a photograph of the Great Lakes area and where the pink dot is, is where I'm from. So I'm making a connection between somebody who's famous and um, within the area about where I'm from. So you get a little bit better understanding about who I am. So next slide, please. This is a photograph of me um, on the runway and running for Miss Teenage Minnesota. And so what this means is that my interest as in, in fashion started when I was a child, when I began making clothes for my Barbie dolls and um, just showing an interest in fashion. I would collect fashion magazines and I really love fabrics and textures and the way that that fabric works when you use it in construction. Next slide, please. So this is a photograph of me and my dancing part of the family. So I have a strong connection to my culture and my community. And we travel throughout the United States and Canada. And I continue the old style jingle dress dance because it's important that our elders told me to always to continue to do 
the things that we have learned as part of our cultural ways so that we can continue to be Native people. Next slide, please. So um, I have a business and the brand is called I Am Anishinaabe. So I am a fashion designer, a fashion show producer, a stylist, indigenous materials jewelry maker. And I'll go a little bit further into what indigenous materials are and a beadwork artist. And here is just an example of some of the magazines where my work has, um, has been featured. Next, um, next slide. So this slide is a photograph of a magazine of a dress that I made. And I consider this to be one of my greatest accomplishments. And what the goal is for my artist is to have their work to be acquired by a museum or a gallery. And this dress was actually acquired by the University of Minnesota's College of Design, the Goldstein Museum of Design. And for me, this is like a full circle in my career because when I was young and I was going to college, it was my goal to get into the Carlson, I don't even know if it's Carlton or Carlson, Carlton School of Business, which was at the University of Minnesota, but I could not get um, the grade that required to allow me to be entered into um, the school. So um, throughout my life then, or throughout my college career, it was actually um, accounting. <laughs> and accounting is really hard. And I took accounting class three times just so that I could tell myself that I could do it. And, um, and so what's really cool is that this came full circle where I couldn't even get to the University of Minnesota. And now, you know, in 2020, they contacted me and or 2021, they contacted me and they wanted to acquire one of my dresses, which is, in, you know, preserved in their gallery. And I was like, whoa, you know, you guys didn't even want me. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is just a, a quick story about to be tenacious. And to use your, your chill time, like your downtime, your quiet times, like in the winter, to make and to create and to just keep moving forward and working on those details and getting to be more um, quality and more fluent as it becomes um, more profic proficient in your artistry. Next screen. So this is a, a photograph of the first um, I want to say fashion shows that I had done in 2015. I had jumped the job track. I worked for uh, my, my band, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe for 20 years. And um, I had always done my beadwork and my artistry. And so um, I got a big grant and I jumped the job track and I started to do my, my creative work, which is what I've been doing since September of 2014. So I got a grant to, to, to show um, traditional um, skirts, the traditional uh, ribbon skirts of native, native women. And um, it was a revitalization of the traditional ribbon skirt as a cultural icon in a contemporary format, making it relevant in today's modern lifestyle. So this is the first collection that I had done um, with my daughters, Lavender Hunt and Sage Davis. And we went on a tour throughout seven prestigious galleries throughout Minnesota. And we showed um, different ways of communicating through art and using the um, ribbon skirt as a canvas. It shows pride in your identity and your heritage and um, uh, it, it communicates your cultural values and beliefs. Um, for men, it's the ribbon shirts, vests, and jewelry is also a way of creating a palette for artistic expression. And so that is what my fashion does for me, and it can do for anybody. It's like the t-shirts that you wear that say, you know, you're on Indian land or land back or Black Lives Matter. It's a canvas of a way to 
express your feelings and your attitudes and to show people what your beliefs are in, in the clothing that you wear. Next slide. So we're going to um, be talking about trade materials. And this is, uh, this is really fun and exciting, I think. So next slide, please. So what we're doing is we're taking a look at this, uh, this drawing and it is a drawing that the first European or the first encounter with Europeans in the Great Lakes mid 1500s. And this is what they seen. And so it's really important to make observations and to take a look at what this person saw while they were um, first arrived on the North American continent. And so they see this woman, it's just one woman, but it's the front and it's the back. And so when you take a look at it, you see that, that she's wearing leather, that she has a headband, that she's got fringes, she's topless, she's got tattoos, and there's canoes in the background. And you know, you take a closer look and you see what they're doing and they're spear fishing. And then somebody in the back on the land is bow hunting. And um, it, it's, it's about sustainable and unsustainability. So I think as a consumer, it's really important to try to make the best choices of all the evils of what is out there. And what I mean is that um, when you're picking your clothing, you know, you have to pick um, fabrics and one of them is like a synthetic and the other one would be a cotton. So they advertise cotton as being natural and organic, but it takes a lot of um, resources to make cotton, um, such as water. It takes like 15,000 gallons of water to make a t-shirt and a pair of jeans. And then with the synthetics then, the thing about synthetics is that it's made from oil. It's a plastic and the little threads go through your washing machine system and it goes down into, eventually it ends up in our, in our lakes and rivers and it becomes pollution. So anytime you make something new, it's going to turn to garbage. It's gonna become waste. And it's like, how can we make, make our um, consumable products last longer? And, and so that's um, something that I think is important as a part of being a native person because we have this relationship with our environment and with the way that things are going these days with pollution, you know, it's a big problem. And I think it's really important that we do our parts in becoming sustainable. And prior to, um, prior to European contact, everything we had was sustainable because it would go back to the earth. Next slide. So the impact of trade on people in the environment caused dependency. In the 1600s was the beginning of the fur trade era and the economic and cultural exchange. By the 1700s, fur trade was firmly established in the Great Lakes with 137 trading posts in Minnesota by 1837. So um, I'll be talking a lot about Minnesota specifically in the Great Lakes areas because that is where I am from and that's where my specialty lies because I'm familiar with the area and the history of this part of the um, United States or the, the Northern continent. So trade goods were blankets, fabrics, steel traps, guns, and et cetera. So what we had is that we had furs and it was very plentiful and we used those furs in trade to make life easier for ourselves as native people. Next, next page. So in 1837, in this area, the beaver were almost extinct in Minnesota and traders moved further west. And at one time it is estimated that millions of bison roamed North America and they were even in Minnesota. By the late 1800s, there were only a few hundred bison left after the European settlers pushed further west, reducing the bison's habitat and hunting them to near extinction. And that today bison are still protected in the Yellowstone National Park. So this is, uh, a very famous photograph of all these bison skulls. So this is about materials and sources and how, um, how we had like unlimited um, 
I want to call them resources, and we'll go into the definition of that a little bit later. But we had unlimited um, use of um, of the land and everything that the Creator gave it gave to us on this land to use for ourselves and um, so that we could survive. And um, and and we were very careful on how we took things, and we were grateful, and we did not over. Um, uh, what is the word? We we don't overconsume. I guess we just took what we needed. Next slide, please. <laughs> so this this is a sample of that. By 1867, the trade beads arrived, and these are chevron beads. And so this is what the Europeans brought with them to make trade with the native people um, in the in North America. And this is um, considered to be a cultural property, a cultural material for Native people because it is something that we liked and it is something that we have cherished and valued throughout the centuries since contact with, with Europeans. And so it is something that um, kind of like became tradition. For example, um, Christmas is not considered a Native holiday, but it is something that we have um, brought into our homes and something that we celebrate as part of a tradition. So tradition being something that you do over and over again and kind of becomes a part of who you are is what these trade beads are like. They're not indigenous to native people. They came from Europe, but because we, we value them since the beginning of time, they have become one of our um, basic um, traditions, I guess. And it's also um, considered an African um, item, an African material, because when Europeans went to Africa, they took the same trade beads there. And so they have um, embraced um, these trade beads as well. So they have become native and they have become African. Next slide. After the French Revolution in 1789, silk had become unpopular in Europe and the French silk industry turned to America as a market for the unwanted ribbons. And although silk ribbons were reserved for royalty and wealthy patrons, natives would trade furs for wool, cotton broadcloth and ribbon. So this is an example of outside influences that contributed to a developing culture and the social changes and how we adapted to those changes and how we embraced those materials and textiles to, be, to become a part of who we are. And when we talk about um, our traditional dress, it includes some of these broad cloth and it includes ribbon because um, this is who we are since a long time ago, 1789, I guess. Next slide, please. So by 1880s, large fur bearing animals became scarce. And so we started to, um, we started to consume these European materials. And this is a photograph of two young Dakota women wearing plaid and calico fabrics. And we also um, embrace these materials because of accessibility, like all of a sudden it became accessible. It was something that was within our reach. It was utilitarian. So besides just having leather, we could have cottons and wools, which helped us to be cool in the summertime and warm in the Winter time, and then because of the aesthetics, because it came with different patterns, different colors, and it was pretty, it was something that we liked. So this is a European impact on native fashion. Next slide, please. So design elements. Um, design elements in, in the design terms of fashion terms means like the ruching, which is like the gathering of the fabric or the, um, the tufting or the, the way that we construct something um, using um, different types of sewing technique. Next slide, please. So as um, materials and designs, 
relates to sharing of culture of indigenous communities and the importance of modernization and not over exploiting resources. So that's something that I keep mentioning. Um, European Americans refer to resources at things as things that we can use and or consume, such as timber, water, plants, and even oil. And natives consider these natural resources as relatives. And it's important in our relationship with the earth and how we understand that each of these resource elements have a spirit. So we remember to be grateful and give thanks to the spirits and the creator for providing all of our relations with purpose and meaning. So it's, you know, we always talk about decolonize your thinking. And it's really a difficult thing to do when you're trying to um, talk about things because you use words in a colonized way, which really um, you're able to communicate your thought, but yet it's still out of the cultural context of the way Native people believe. So, um, so this is like addressing a little bit of that. And so there are indigenous cultures in the Northern Hemisphere that are very similar when it comes to the limited reliability on outside influence for fashion design and resiliency. And that includes like Alaska, Siberia to Northern Europe. The Amish leave a very minimal environmental footprint because of their cultural and spiritual beliefs. And some of our traditions are in our the way we dress and tattoos, the materials that we trade and harvest in moderation, and then maintaining a strong identity through our design. And these are like the really important aspects about native cultural design and um, and being really um, I guess cognizant about our relationship to the to our mother, the earth, and that there are other indigenous cultures out there who who have who share the same um, values. Next slide, please. So um, I talk about global trends as well, like what was happening in the 15th and 17th centuries in Europe, and one example is this kind of dress that has crinoline. And crinoline is a fabric made from horse hair that they, that they would use to make these hoops because the dresses were like huge, like boom, you know, and, and that's very beautiful. Next slide. So this is an example of sharing cultures too between um, European countries. On the left-hand side, it's called a chemise de la Aglaise which was invented by Marie Antoinette during the French Revolution in 1789. And prior to the French Revolution and Marie Antoinette was, was known for being very extremely extravagant. And then on the right-hand side, there's um, a photo of a robe a la Polonaise, which was derived from Poland in 1750 to 1790. And so what was going on with these other European countries is that there was this French revolution going on and that the style changed. And Marie Antoinette was a leader in that because she changed it as a style um, which was really scaled down from the extravagance and for comfort. And there was also a ban on silks and satins during the French revolution. So there was a lot of cotton and wool fibers that became really popular. So the thing about this is that if you look on the right hand side, you can see that this uh, robe a la Polonaise, it has the word robe in it. So you know it's like an overcoat. And then underneath that overcoat is the chemise. So this became um, a style and it, and it um, found itself in North America as well. And, and uh, it just traveled all over. And I have to call it North America because it was before the United States became the United States. Next slide. And this is a, um, a, a time frame. So in the 1880s, this is an American dress shop along the Eastern coast. So it was probably New York City or someplace fancy like that. And it took 200 years for this fashion to arrive in America and was mostly along the East Coast. And then it took 
I don't know, maybe another 100 years or 50 years for this style to reach the Great Lakes. So you have to understand that the way that um, transportation occurred back in the days when, when style was first developing with the European fabrics was that it got to the Great Lakes through these big rivers like the um, St. Lawrence River, or you know, it came across by horses or foot. And I like to show this, um, this photograph because um, it's a failure for trends to take hold. And so this trend was not popular with native women because it was not a part of our lifestyle because we had different types of housing. We had wigwams here that were made out of birch, clark, birch bark in the Great Lakes area. And then we had teepees that were made from buffalo robes out in the plains. And then we had earth homes over in the um, prairies. So, so, and plus like the Anishinaabe people, we moved from season to season from our fish camp over to our maple sugar camp, to our fighting, to our fighting, our hunting camp, then our harvesting camp. And then we had to hunker down in the winter time. So this style of dress was not feasible for native women to be wearing because um, you know we had no place, we had no closets to hang it up in, <laughs> no space. So uh, next slide, please. And this is a video. That's a little otter sliding down a hill. And what's really important is to take a look at his tracks that he's leaving behind him. And we can go to the next slide. So this is what the uh, tracks look like that the little otter left. And as native people, and um, I suppose all people, you know, they take a look around at their landscape and they find beauty in everything and you can look at this little track and say oh my gosh look at the pattern that 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 little otter made and i i want to replicate that that imagery in that artistry in a creative format to express who i am because i am a person who lives among the otters and who playfully slide down in the snow in the winter time so that is called the otter tail track and this is very popular. Oh yeah, next slide, please. And this is very popular in this style. And so this is a, a traditional way of making um, applique. And so the element, you know, the design word for element now is, a, is, a, is elements are like the construction process. So the design element of traditional applique making was cutting, folding, tucking, layering color combinations in contrasting ways to create these really awesome um, designs. And so it's, it's tedious work, it always is, everything's always tedious and everything is always a process. So it's not difficult, it's easy, but it's time consuming and it's a process. Next slide, please. And this is a contemporary applique process. So this, these days, We've got double-sided um, interfacing. We've got irons that heat up and melt glue. We've got glue, we've got pins. We've got all these fancy sewing machines and um, uh, this equipment that makes sewing a whole lot faster. And so this, um, this is just an example of modern day. And this is an example of the skirt that I made. And this is some of the things that you can be doing in the winter months when you're holed up in your home and it's cold outside. So you can just be sitting around and cutting your patterns. You can draw your patterns. You can start ironing your patterns onto the background. And this is actually the process that you take for the contemporary applique process, which is starting from the top where you would make your patterns, you draw your patterns, then you put your patterns onto some plastic or something that's sturdy so you can maintain your patterns for, you know, eternity, you can put them in um, a drawer and pull them out as you need them. And then you, you, you do the interfacing, you 
melt it with an iron onto that white background. Then you cut the white background out, which is the next um, little photograph. Then you've got all your little patterns or designs out in a um, in little little sections. Then you take that, and it would be the third photograph down. And then you start placing it in a um, composition form onto your fabric, and then you you iron that down. And then you've got the final piece on the bottom where you actually sew it down. And then I added sequins for a a um, little bit of bling. It's fancy. It makes it pop, and it it just um looks very um native, like traditional to my Anishinaabe floral culture. Next slide, please. So then we're going to be talking about the indigenous materials originating or occurring naturally in a particular place, and it means native. So that's just a little bit vocabulary about what indigenous means. And we use our indigenous materials as choices in our adornment, showcasing our skills, and showcasing the landscape or the land from where we are from. Next slide. And so um, one highly, very, very, very highly valued um, material is uh, the wampum shell. So wampum is like recipro reciprocity <laughs> to among tribal nations and to the indigenous period materials that are residual from Mother Earth or from hunting, fishing, and gathering for food. So it's about, um, I guess that what I wanna say about the slide is that these are the materials that we use. They come from the earth and we want to have this reciprocal relationship with our materials that the creator gave us, which is natural that comes from the earth. And so that it's kind of residual means like leftover. So, you know, these are the shells that wash up on the shore and we pick them up. And a long time ago, it was a very, very tedious, very difficult process to make beads from it because they were using just the materials that they received from, um, from the earth and that was available to them. Um, but once the Europeans came, they, they had brought tools with them and other equipment and metal things, like I said, that made life a lot easier for us. So they had the beads on the left-hand side from the whelk shell, and you can see how it's kind of like curled and how it would be become, say, like a bugle bead kind of a style. And then on the left-hand or the right-hand side is the quahog shell and how you chip them into um, chips, and then you can uh, file them and polish them and put a hole in them and you know cut them into different shapes, and then how we use them today to adorn ourselves and. These came from the uh, Wampanoag people over in um, the east side of the North America. And these were highly valuable and we traded amongst each other for our things that we considered valuable and we like to adorn ourselves with them. Next page. So this is a photograph of copper and copper um, is very um, prized among the, the people of the Lake Superior and the Great Lakes. And copper was once plentiful. And in a book written by William W. Warren, Heritage of the, or History of the Ojibwe People, he talks about uh, a piece of copper that weighed, oh, I don't know, 10 tons or something like that, that was plentiful around this area, but now it has been um, mined and overmined to the point of it be, being scarce. But copper um, was once plentiful and it's a sacred material to the Anishinaabe, which is what I am. And it is becoming depleted, although it's still mined in the Michigan Peninsula. So it would be, uh, something that's similar to oil, something that's mined, something that we have to dig for to get out of um, the earth so that we can use it in ways that make life easier for us, I guess. That's how I wanna, wanna say that. So copper is, um, is an indigenous material because it's found here. 
Next slide. So um, this, these are elk's teeth. These are also highly prized and they're um, kind of culturally appropriate to the Absolute people, the Crow people. Um, value it a lot and it's really become a strong part of their culture and that it takes many years to gather this many teeth through hunting and it's a way of communicating to everybody that the woman was bragging without having to you know voice brag but she bragged quietly about the skills of her husband being you know this great hunter that he could you know, bring home all these elk and feed the community and feed the, the, the family. And then to continue to save these teeth throughout the years to, to accumulate them, because there's only two of them per, um, per elk. And that created value. And so it, it, it's, it looks like it is an abundance, but it took a long time to get this. You don't just go out and kill, you know, 500 elk to get two of their teeth. It's it's a process, it's a lifestyle, and it's how we used um, our indigenous materials to show who we are as a people. So next slide, please. This is um, bone, bones. And um, this also talks about how we, or goes to show the sustainability about this is something that we use, um, an example of how we use every part of the animal and how we appreciate the painstaking um, labor that it takes to make the materials and then the art and the skill of making something with these materials, these bones such as a chest plate um, or a breast plate, uh, for example. And so this is, you know, the materials that we had prior to Europeans arriving and and, and it just goes to show another example of how we use our indigenous materials to show the pride in who we are today. You know, we use them today to show our pride because it is um, connected to our ancestors and, and the way our ancestors looked and how they showed their pride in um, their ability to hunt and who they are. Next slide. So this is a uh, birch bark, which is plentiful around here. Um, the brown part is the inner birch bark and the white part is the outer birch bark. And we used to use um, birch bark as paper and we would cut patterns in it, such as what's shown on the right. And we would use these patterns because um, we could use them over and over again. And so we didn't have plastic and we didn't have, you know, cardboard or these materials that would last a long time. So we would use our birch bark to save our patterns so that we could use our patterns over and over again. And it is um, very delicate, you know, it's fragile. It doesn't last forever. It's gonna deteriorate, it's gonna curl, it's gonna rip and um, it's just eventually gonna um, go back to the earth which is considered a sustainable uh, way of, I suppose, part of the composting process, which is good, and that birch bark can be harvested without hurting the tree. Next slide. Back, I think it's back. Oh no, Ed, you're right. Okay, I went, I went ahead. So let's see. Okay, so these are porcupine quills and porcupine quills can also be ha uh, harvested without the animal, without hurting the animal. And so a lot of people think that quills, that porcupines throw their quills, but they don't. You have to actually touch the porcupine in order for the quill to come off. And so that's why you see dogs, you know, that are just covered with porcupine quills all in their mouths because they they don't realize that until after they bite the porcupine and then they have a mouthful of quills. So at the end of the porcupine quill, the black part, you can see in the photograph, it's the pointy part and that pointy part has a little hook. And my grandma always said, don't get that porcupine quill hooked into your hand or into your body anywhere because it crawls. And so what she, what she means by crawls is that that hook 
will pierce you and then you can't get it out and it goes further and further into your skin. So it can be, you know, kind of dangerous and it's probably the um, natural way that a porcupine defends itself. But we use porcupine, we use the porcupine hair to make our porky roaches. Um, we call them Meskwazikins in Ojibwe language. It's the roach that the men wear on their heads when they um, dance. And here's another, another example of how porcupine quills are used on this jacket. So they're wrapped and they're sewn. And um, it's, a, it's an indigenous um, material that we also used prior to European um, contact. Next page. These are gemstones. On the left-hand side is the amethyst and on the right side are rubies. And they're found within the earth's surface and are prized for their rare color and translucence. So of course, everybody loves gemstones because they they can be you know, carved to be sparkly and they're so um, beautiful and they're rare. Next slide. This is this are another couple um, traditional style of beads. By 1850, the seed beads arrived in the Great Lakes area, and we used them um, to make bandolier bags. And then bandolier bags were eventually picked up by other tribes, such as the Ho Chunk, and um, are kind of like staple um, accessories to um, our traditional indigenous native designs. And so on the left-hand side are the white hearts, and then on the right-hand side are the greasy yellows. So it's just a little bit example about the time period of when beads arrived here in the Great Lakes area and how we use them. The next slide, please. So this is an example of the left-hand side is um, when, so we were here before America became America and the federal government would come to us and they would say, hey, we want, you, we want you guys to do a favor, do us a favor and could you take our American flag and can you hang it up outside of your teepee? Can you hang it up above your, your wigwam just to show all the other um, predators or governing um, countries that are coming to uh, the North America to show them that you have this allegiance with, with the federal government of what we're going to call the United States. So they would say, sure, you know, we, we can do that. You know, they take the flag and hang it up and then maybe grandma or mom would come out and they'd say, hey, you know, that, that flag up there really isn't doing much good. It would look better on me if I, if I made it into a skirt or a jacket or used it for utilitarian purposes, which is what we did. So this is an example of how, you know, a, a United States flag could be used for something such as a woman's skirt. She liked the colors. It was very, um, uh, like I said, utilitarian in purpose, and it was more functional. So on the right-hand side is an example of a skirt that I made, and on it, it has um, silver ring brooches, which is another uh, piece of jewelry that was prevalent among trade um, in, in North America. Next, next slide. So this is an Anishinaabe man from Lac de Flambeau and his name was Inge Gijig. John Martin was his English name, born in 1876 to 1950. And this is a fine example of Great Lakes um, woodland style clothing from the 1800s to the 1900s and it's floral beadwork on velvet. And um, this, it's like distinct. You can look at that and you could say, hey, you know, they must be, you know, Cree or Ho-Chunk or Potawatomi or Anishinaabe or Meskwaki because we all share the same environment of the Great Lakes with the florals and the trees and the um, lakes because of um, where we live. So it, Flowers are not considered feminine or masculine when it comes to design style for native people. It's just um, a design that is indigenous to our landscape. Next one. And this is an example of a woman's outfit, um, a floral Great Lakes woodland outfit. Um, I made the skirt here, it's beaded. And um, it's just an example of, so that was a man's outfit. Now this is a woman's outfit. Next, 
next um, screen, please. And so this is two spirit identity as well. So this um, a woman called me and and she said, you know, I have always had this dream of being um, this particular style dancer. I'm I'm a Potawatomi and and I and I'm two spirit. I identify as a man. And people have told me, you know, that I need to wear my skirt, but I'm not comfortable in a skirt. You know, what do you think about all these things? And I said, well, how about wearing like a, a, a ribbon shirt? How do you feel about wearing a ribbon shirt? Oh, yeah, I would be, you know, happy to do that, but I don't want to wear a skirt. And I was told that I have to. And so then I said, well, I have this vision of this dance outfit. You know, it's got these aprons, it's got these vests, and um, it's got this clan system, it's got the waters, the wild rice, the strawberries, and, you know, flowers, and just things that are really important to us as um, Native people in this area. And he said, oh my God, you know, that was exactly, exactly what I had, you know, in my mind. And, and, and it took about a year, you know, for him to call me and say, okay, I'm ready to do this. So this was the outfit that I made for him. And it is another way of communicating who you are, that you want to be identified as a man and that you want to have all these special influences, these um, images that are important to who you are to show pride in your culture and your heritage. So next culture, next cultures, <laughs> next screen. So, um, what I really want to say too, you know, is to talk about the native worldview and how important it is to listen to your elders. And I remember as a young person, it seemed like elders were always complaining about the changes in the world, how nothing is the same. And I didn't see, you know, changes in the world as a bad thing. And now I understand that they were talking about keeping your culture, because if you lose your cultural teachings, your cultural activities, values, and beliefs, we will no longer exist as natives. So these are the key points and what my elders taught me was that um, they're traditional cultural norms and it's about sustaining and preserving your culture into perpetuity, about moderation. You know, it's really important to do everything in moderation, not to overtake and not to overuse, overconsume, over anything. And um, when it comes to destruction, it, to recognize our place in the environment that without, you know, all these things that the creator gave us that are um, available on Mother Earth, that we would not be able to exist. And so we have to be respectful and we have to always be grateful. And then to, as we, re, re, I always have a hard time with that word, reciprocity, you know, to show um, a give and take relationship with the earth and everything when you, when you take something that you give something back and that you acknowledge that um, spirit of that, of that item or that element, I want to call it. And then to have personal integrity and to be accountable to yourself and to be accountable to your um, seventh generation. So not only to yourself, but to your children and your grandchildren, your great grandchildren onto perpetuity, because nobody is going to be, you know, telling you, you can't do this and you can't do that. But it's about being, you know, having that personal integrity. I'm not going to cheat anybody. I'm not going to I'm talk bad about anybody. I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that because I in turn um, need blessings from the spirits and the creator. And if I'm a good person, you know, I will be taken care of and I, and I can feel confident, feel good about that. And then about capitalism creates waste. And that goes back to, you know, picking out the things that um, are going to be um, useful, you know, things that are going to last for a long time. And that kind of goes into my next screen too. Like to take, so the takeaway is about know where you're sourcing your materials, um, know where things come from, know the meanings and the values of things, to select materials that have the least negative impact on the environment, um, to thrift, 
to reuse, to recycle, to repurpose, repair, reduce, and re-gift. And it's kind of like um, when you give somebody a gift, you give it to them in a good way and you say, here, this is yours. Do with it what you want. And if that person can't use it and they give it to somebody else, you know, don't have hurt feelings or don't be sad about it. Like, oh, they didn't like what I gave them or they didn't appreciate it because, you know, in the Indian way, the native way, we give things that are valuable to us. And we're like, oh my gosh, you know, my mother gave me this and it's just a little something, but it means so much to me. And because you mean so much to me, I'm going to give it to you. You know, so when you give things, just let it go and know that you've given it in a good way and they might give it in a good way. And then to focus on design, composition and construction when it comes to creating um, that uh, a whole bunch of stuff like overkill on, um, um, oh, I don't know, maybe furs or something like that. You know, you don't want to overdo things that that makes it so beautiful. Like, look, I have, um, I don't know, I have 50 foxtails on this thing, you know, which meant, you know, you had to kill 50 foxes in order to get their tail, you know, and, and their tails are very, very beautiful, but that's not what's beautiful about the particular item that you're making. What's really important is the colors that you use, you know, the, the designs that you put into it and the work that you go into constructing it with all of your little creases and your pleats and your tufting and your ruching and, and all that kind of um, details. And the next picture is of the Ogichidakwe Wag, which is our warrior women. So these are our, our protector women who went into the military to serve and to give for what they call their country, what they gave for their people and their nations so that they could, um, so that we could continue to live, you know, in, in, in a free way as best as possible. And so we have a, a, a large um, a thankfulness, a large appreciation for the people who go off into the military and into the wars. And I think what's really beautiful here is that they're making a very strong and yet feminine um, communication to us. They're wearing their traditional ribbon skirts, you know, and, and skirts are considered a design for women and two-spirit two women as well, you know, the femininity of it, but yet they are strong and they are protectors and they are um, military and we reserve the utmost respect for them. So that's a, a, a very strong communication um, about using your art. The next photograph, please. So these are my recommended reading for uh, Anishinaabe culture and history by uh, native authors from a show miss book. Um, it is, it looks like a coloring book and it looks like a child's book, but it has a lot of really important information about, about native think, you know, decolonizing your thinking. And these are the traditional stories about our creation and how we get along with each other and our relationship with animals and the environment. And then the history of the Ojibwe people is more of a historical content by William W. Warren. And he just um, documented all these historical events in this area that are um, really important to the history of who we are today and what has happened to us as um, native people of the Great Lakes area. Next slide, please. So miigwech bisindawieg, thank you for listening to me. My, um, I have a website, it is iamanishinaabe.com and follow me at Anishinaabe Kwenin on Instagram. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Miigwech, Delana. I know um, this presentation is very, out of the ordinary for a lot of what we do in the prevention field. But one of the reasons I wanted to invite um, her to present and share with us today and her expertise in her field is because here in the area of the Leech Lake community, uh, the tribal community, she is initiating a program to engage our young people at a local school. And I'm gonna invite her to share about that because it's so important that during this time, 
we think of ways during the winter time that we think of ways to engage our young people, keep them um, on a healthy path so that they do not fall into the peer pressures and the other things that happen as a young person when they're trying to make choices. And so I saw a few of you post things in the chat talking about uh, some of the tradition of how it means to be a good relative. If you saw, I think there was one about um, a porcupine on the road that your grandma taught you to pick it up and you may not have a use for it, but how you can share that with somebody in your community or in your family who might have a use for it. And that's what it is all about, finding those ways to connect through social wellness, um, through engaging our young people in healthy conversations and healthy activities. And um, I wanna invite uh, Delana to speak a little bit about the project that she's initiating with our young people up at the Leech Lake area in the school system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm going to be working with the Deer River School District, um, which is a local school district here on the Leech Lake Reservation, and it's called Leech Lake Placemaking. And if you're familiar with the arts community, placemaking means making art in certain places. And what it's meant to do is to slow you down throughout your fast, fast, busy activities throughout the day. And like you come to a, um, a cross a crossroads where um, there's a stop sign there and all of a sudden you see this beautiful artwork and you say, oh my gosh, that's pretty. It really reminds me of this or that. So you're kind of taking a moment to, to refocus you know, about the arts and that's what the arts is supposed to do for you is to create this beauty. But for what we are doing, my husband and I and the teachers working with the Deer River School District is that we're calling it um, placemaking as a way to um, engage students with our local historical areas here throughout the reservation. And it, it's, it's hard to call it a reservation because it's all native land. So it's going to take place off the reservation too to, to connect to some of these historical sites where specific things are happening. Like we know where the walleyes will be um, laying their eggs in the springtime. So we're gonna go and take a look at that. There's a dam that was built that um, caused a great um, disturbance or change in the way that native people lived in that particular area because it cut off the, the water that we had access to. There's a bridge that we can stand on and look at a point on the reservation where a historic event took place. So we're going to be bringing students there so that they can connect to the land and that they can have a relationship with the environment and all these elements and all these spirits that are with these elements. Because I was always told too that with my, with my native name, we call them Indian names. When we're given an Indian name, it is a connection to one of the spirits. And like I said, mine is wades in the water. So the water is very important to me in my, in my life. And I live on the lake shores of the water and the water has significant meaning to me about you know bathing with it and making a connection to your ancestors and then feeling that connection. And having that Indian name reminds us about who we are and what our connection is and our place in the um, universe. And it also, that connection shows you that you are related and that you are never alone because you have this relationship with this particular um, being, you know, whether it's the stars or the sun or the day or, you know, the thunderbirds and then like me, it's the water. So we're going to be working with the high school students to do that, maybe some middle school students. And I'm going to be going in and I have taught a skirt making class previously. And we talked about the importance of our cultural traditional ribbon skirts. And, um, and it was a basic sewing class, but now we're going to be doing an advanced sewing class. And with the um, results of the, the dresses and the apparel that we make, I'm going to be bringing them, inviting them to show at Native Fashion Night Minneapolis. Um, in Minnesota because I do fashion shows and they're going to give these young people a moment in time to be on stage and to be adored by people and to be given um, recognition for their skills and their 
design skills and construction of the apparel that they're making. So it, it, it's really um, giving pride to these young people and making that connection in traditional ways so that they know who they are and that they have a strong identity and connection to this place about where they're from, to their ancestors. And, um, and, and I believe that having that strong identity gives them confidence to move forward and to navigate in the two worlds in which they live. Thank you for sharing. Um, and this does tie back to our K through 12 program. Last spring, we had our um, initial issue of Cultivate, which is a newsletter that came out of our mental health K through 12 center. And one of the articles in there speaks to the idea of indigenous art as healing, whether it's fashion, like she shared today, basket weaving, beading, music. There are so many different um, opportunities for our young people to find ways to heal um, through the intergenerational, intergenerational trauma that we've all experienced in our own communities. And it's a really good opportunity for us as professionals in the field to use art as therapy. In the chat, I put a couple of different links. I put um, her direct contact information, www.imnashnabi.com. I put our post event survey link also for you to please help us with that after today's event. And then I invited you to also look at our newsletter that looks at cultivating art, indigenous art as healing uh, ways for our young people. We have about uh, 10 minutes left. If anybody has questions, you're welcome to mute yourself and ask our presenter. Um, but I wanna say miigwech, thank you. It's been wonderful to hear about our culture through art, through history, um, and the important ways that we've learned to navigate uh, our relationships. If you have a question, you can post it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and you can ask her. Or if you just have a comment, you can do that as well. Well, as we're waiting for anybody to ask a question, I will go back to sharing. Oh, there's something in the chat. Hi. Um, I, I'll, this is Jean. Yes. And I'd like to make a comment. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And when I present um, on wellness in my community, which is Hunkpati uh, Oyate in Fort Thompson, South Dakota. And what I find is I can say, this is how you um, try to be sober. This is how you, what you need to accomplish to stay clean from drugs. And then I find they're like, well, then what? So in my presentations, I started including hobbies, interests, and crafts like beading kits, and I hope to do ribbon skirts, but we really need our nations to remember our culture and traditions. And when you see the beauty of uh, Delina's designs, it makes you happy. And that is what you know. I hope to share with uh, a lot of people because we really do um, need that. And a lot of times, um, and it's a long process, but when you show those pictures, I wish we had more pictures to show because I see them, they start, like she said, she, they go, oh, I remember my grandma used to have a design like that, or, you know, and so I appreciate this. And I hope we all leave from this to encourage people from all walks to have hobbies and interests and crafts that are, um, they, they keep busy with their hands and their minds and their spirit and, you know. So yeah, this was very good. Thank you very much, Pidamaya. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Yeah, I just wanna say too, what, what to add on a little bit about what you said, like everybody has different teachings, you know, and it's really important to listen to your um, elders and to understand what it is they're trying to say to you because sometimes they say things but it means something different <laughs> and, or they'll say something and you can't apply it to everything. You can apply it to one thing or, or another, you know, cause it's just like the world is so complex, but 
So my teaching is that, you know, whenever you're feeling sad or upset or angry or any of these yucky feelings, you know, is to pick up your, your sewing and to sew or pick up your, you know, weaving, if that's what you do or whatever your art is, that to pick that up and that's going to change you. It's going to heal you. And yeah. so in the Anishinaabe language, um, we call our beads money do money do um money do manes. and that means little spirits so it's like these little oh. beads are little spirits when you're working with them and they take away all that yucky feeling because i've heard some people say oh when you're feeling yucky stay away from your from your um art because all your yuckiness will go into that you know, and I believe that too, you know, and, and I made, I made a, um, a barrette for a friend of mine. And when I gave it to her, I said, oh, you need to smudge it off really good because I was having a hard time and, you know, and, and all these yucky feelings are in this barrette. So be sure you smudge it off and chase all them feelings away. <laughs> yes, but, I, I agree. It, it takes effort. Um, I took a, quilting class and I admire people who make star quilts and I will never ever complain about the price that they ask for. And one of the women shared in the group that her father, you know, cause as a traditional way, we talk about going to this uh, next world, the spirit world, however you want to view it. And he told her, I want you to stay busy for, uh, for the year after my death with your hands and do things for when you have the memorial. And she did. So that's how she picked up quilting. And she is just wonderful. And she shares that beauty with people. So, um, you know, it, it does. And, and you do. And you pray and you say, OK, you know, let those yucky feelings or feelings of dissension leave me so I can just focus on it. And you find yourself calming down. So mm -hmm. this was good. Thank you, Native Center. This was good today. You're welcome. You're welcome. I know that um, I can speak for myself. I'm, I don't find myself to be very creative. And so if you're in that area where you don't have the talents or the gifts to, to actually do these as people who are helping in this um, prevention field or who are helping as therapists and uh, counselors, we can always find experts like we found today. I know here where I live in Minnesota myself, there's a local art gallery that just started this month of January teaching people how to bead for free. And so look for resources in your community. You know, uh, Delina is actually able to do this program. She and her husband are doing this together in a local school district um, at one of the tribal communities that has a need. And it's an opportunity for our young people to learn a skill, learn something to keep them actively engaged in a healthy way. And who knows where it'll take them 20, 30 years from now. They may be the, they may be the next fashion designer out of Leech Lake. Um, <laughs> it's really important to teach our young people um, their connection to culture and be healed and whatever's troubling them, whatever they're experiencing during um, the course of a school day and gives them a break from sitting there and learning the traditional uh, classroom setting and gives them an opportunity to be creative and show their creativity and really embrace their identity and their culture through the arts. Any other comments or questions for our presenter? Again, in the chat, I put um, a few things for you. The post-event survey link, which is very helpful to our center. And then we also have the opportunity for you to contact her directly by looking up her information on her website. And I wanna remind you all that our next session is gonna be two weeks from now on January 31st. And we're gonna be using the art of storytelling and music, another way that we can stay connected to our culture. Um, we'll have um, another presenter coming to present and share her gifts, her skills, and the work that she does with her tribal community and across the country using this opportunity for storytelling and song. If you go to our website, you can probably register for that. January 31st is the next opportunity.
Well, I'd like to honor you all by giving you six minutes back to your day. I want to say thank you, miigwetched, nalit sam. Keep continuing on a good path as we continue to be good relatives to one another and to ourselves. Enjoy your day. <laughs>